I mean, there might be a point when my persistent defence of Israel's right to defend itself is altered by the... If I believe that the response is just being totally disproportionate... And the fascinating question for me with this pause we're having right now is what happens next? If, as some reports are suggesting, Israel is going to start attacking the south and doing to the south what it did to the north, there's going to be no Gaza left. You said that you've always tried to be fair about mm. this conflict between Israel and Hamas, to report it fairly. Why this conflict? Why the buy-in? Um, it would have been OK for you to go light on it, to give you know, watchers and listeners mm. a break... Why this conflict? For some reason, our show has really resonated with people from almost the first day of the, of the conflict. I'm not quite sure why, but we suddenly noticed huge numbers of people uh, watching the show on YouTube. And I mean huge. Like I interviewed Bassam Youssef, who was the uh, Arab John Stewart. 21 million people watched that on our YouTube channel. Over 10 million watched the rematch when I did him again in Los Angeles. We've seen similar numbers for people like Andrew Tate when he's talked about the conflict, for the president of Israel, for the uh, Palestinian ambassador of the UK and so on. And it's been consistent and extremely large volumes of, of people wanting to disseminate this. And <clears throat> quite early on, I said, look, it's obvious for some reason our strategy of platforming people from both sides, sometimes against each other, but often one-on-one, -on -one, giving them a chance to talk, to actually give their side of it, uh, uncensored, it's the name of the show, and we like to live up to that, seems to have captured the right uh, mood with people. Now, look, you're always never going to please people on the extremities of both sides of this debate. So at the moment, I'm detested by <clears throat> people on both sides who only see it through their own blinkered view. Which is a good place to be, by the it's way. It's the best place to be. Yeah. Yeah. For, for any journalist, yeah, it's the place absolutely. you want to be. You want to have people on the extremities to be thinking that you're not on their side. Well, I'm not on anyone's side. Yeah. I'm on the side of truth as a journalist with this. Um, but I'm also on my side, I've got to say, I've gone on a real journey of learning about this conflict. You know, I was at CNN for years and had to cover a few flare-ups then, nothing quite on the scale of this. But, you know, I did a bit of the learning there. But i got to say, day in, day out, when you're talking to people who've been immersed in this sometimes for 50 years, mm. you get a really smart insight into both sides, how they think. And I thought Jonathan Friedland at The Guardian had, had the best summary of this. If you go back long enough, you find both sides have a just cause. And really, that's part of the problem, in a sense, is that they both have a yeah. just cause and feel equally implacably determined to affect their cause. And that's where you see the sharp end of this conflict. You've described yourself as having a lot of moral quandaries <sighs> about the conflict. The conversation has to be nuanced. You've said that before mm. numerous um, interviews Jordan Peterson and others. Mm. I think many people have been surprised by that. They would expect you to take the most controversial route. And in a way, you've had controversial guests, mm. but you've been mm. very fair about this. Mm. What do you think about that? I think I think people, some people, and I've been speaking to some friends over the weekend who probably wouldn't normally watch your show, mm. whose partner has said, have you seen what Piers Morgan's mm. done here? Have you seen this guy that he's interviewing? Um and I think opinions are starting to change, if that doesn't sound too unfair mm. based on your remarkable career so far. What do you make of that? Well, it takes me back a little bit to the Iraq war, for example, where I was the Daily Mirror editor. We were supposed to be the pro-Labour newspaper and I took on Tony Blair about the Iraq war. And in fact, the biggest march this country's ever seen was against the Iraq war. and Most of them are carrying Daily Mirror, Mirror no war placards. Um, so I always remind people on the... Arab side of this debate. Well, I was there for the Arab world then. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got to go back in the history of my right. career to see that I always try and be fair-minded about all of these things. I've criticised the Israelis, as people are reminding me, a series of tweets I did in 2014, where I thought the Israel response to an incident then involving the kidnapping and, and killing of three teenagers was massively disproportionate. And I said so. So I, I take all these stories. As I try to take them as I find them and make a calculation based on what I really feel about it. But I remember from the Iraq war in the mirror, some days we'd have John Pilger on one page and Christopher Hitchens on the other. Hitchens arguing in favour of the war. And it was just great journalism, really, because people could read these two incredible polemists arguing completely different arguments about it. But when you read both, 
you almost invariably would say, well, they've both got good points. I want that to be what our show, and I think it is, as it has now become a really important fulcrum in this debate for a lot of people like me, who are not as expert in this conflict as people right in the thick of it. You know, I'm an Irish Catholic, but I'm a, somebody who knew about what happened in Northern Ireland. And I do know that eventually, through dialogue and good leadership, and that's going to be crucial here too, we did eventually get to peace, which people didn't expect would mm. happen. So it can be done. I just don't think it can be done with the current leadership on either side. And did you, before you went down this route... Was this an accidental route in terms of let's give both sides space? Or was this, um, from the start, something that you wanted to do? Because, um, as I said, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily fit the trope of what people might expect, maybe not from Talk TV, but also from, from you as well. When was it? I mean, I find, I've got to say, I find that people's views of me and how I come at these things often are not based on actual watching what I do well, it's or what I say. Well, probably based on Twitter clips of you walking off sets or yeah. saying something controversial there's a kind of pantomime or getting villain. a line out of someone. Yeah, there's a pantomime villain caricature, which I don't do a lot to dissuade mm. people of. Um, but underneath it, I've had over 30 years of being at the Shah Bender really big stories, 10 years editing national newspapers, four years at CNN with huge breaking news stories then, um, you know, morning television with all the big news that used to break there as well and now here so you know i've covered a lot of big stuff and like i said i, I think i was surprised simply that almost immediately we were getting these huge audiences on this mm. and i just said to the team they've driven the content so was it a decision well, they've given the, to offer equal space yeah or? they've given the decision making to make sure we keep platforming people on both sides mm. this does not take a side let's not have a horse in this mm ugly, horrible, hideous race. Let's just try and platform people on both sides who have something to contribute. And occasionally we put them against each other and sometimes it can be very volatile, sometimes much more thoughtful. Sometimes we'll have very you know, extreme guests who say things which really make me you know, slightly blanch when I hear it. But other times you get people incredibly nuanced. And I think it's the mixture of all of this stuff. It's surprising, it feels fresh. And I think that a lot of people like me are having moral quandaries about this. A lot of people feel what happened on October the 7th was so horrendous. Of course Israel has to defend itself. A lot of people think that Hamas's stated intent only a week ago to keep doing this as often as they can is an existential threat to Israel. But how do they take out Hamas? is the big question. Mm. Can you do it in any different way yeah. to the way they're doing it? And at what, what is point, proportionate? And at what point do the total civilian casualties become uh, morally unjustified? And that's, that's the really interesting mm. moral question, which I'm not sure most people in the middle have really figured out yet. The, the personalities that you are using for some of these debates, where you're giving equal space to both sides, I'll mention a few of them, Andrew Tate... Jordan Peterson, each you know, each with huge global following, mm. uh, informing the debate, informing our conversations around them, rather than academics, university professors, etc. Well, we've had those too. Okay, mm. but the big drivers here have mm. been controversial figures like Andrew Tate, you know, charged with human trafficking and rape. Jordan Peterson, his his himself, a very controversial figure. Mm. Why use those figures? Why was it important to hear from Andrew Tate? On well, Andrew Tate, I just think he's, uh, for the same reason the BBC wanted to interview him, you know, he's, at the moment he's, his trial hasn't happened. It may never happen. We don't know yet. He's in the wheels of Romanian justice. He's emphatically denied all the charges against him. And he, you know, whether we like Andrew Tate or not, um, a part of his, his shtick, I think, resonates in a positive way for young men. Part of it really uh, offends me on behalf of women and he has a misogynist street which is undeniable but he also has extremely opinionated views about things like the war in fact the exchange i had with him about the war was one of the most fascinating i think mm. of the entire it was much more nuanced wasn't it much more I, nuanced and it was a really I good expected. debate you know the guy's a smart guy and he debates you know in a very passionate way um you know i think that i would say that i would contrast that for example with people like this uh, Palestinian doctor who had uh, been born in one of the refugee camps in Gaza. His parents had been displaced there in 1948. So he'd been living this his whole life. You know, I think 28 members of his family had been killed since the start of the airstrikes on October the uh, 7th, 8th. And, and yet he came with a message of peace. 
and he'd lost you know his own kids he's three children were blown up years ago in one of the earlier uh, outbreaks of war here from an israeli tank so he's the last person you would expect it was incredibly moving and he was in tears in that interview so I think we're, we're seeing all different types of people, mm. but the common thread is they all have an interesting view about what's going on. And I hope the viewer can sit back at home and disseminate all of this and come to a better informed opinion. Are you choosing Andrew Tate because you're genuinely interested in his view or are you choosing him because he will generate views, he will um, allow you to get the platform out there to more people? And let's be realistic, we all work in media, we have to weigh up sure. those decisions. Is this guest going to give me uh, some mm. great exposure? Is this the right guest morally? Is this mm. the right guest to sit on my platform? All good questions. And I, I had no moral problem interviewing someone like Andrew Tate at this uh, place he finds himself in. Uh, I wouldn't interview him if he'd been convicted mm. of any of these crimes. But three hours with him? Well, three hours with him, but, you know, it's been watched by, I don't know, I think collectively with his brother, something like 15 million people. And my argument about that would be you're, you're getting a vast audience of impressionable young, often, in his case, male young minds, uh, and you're getting them to have a a listen to a really good debate, actually. I thought the debate that we had, not just about misogyny, which was really interesting, but also about the war, were things that I want his audience to hear. You know, Andrew Tate, whether people like him or not, wields incredible influence. When I walk around the streets, one in five people that come up to me ask me about Andrew Tate, and they're normally young men, right? It's incredible. And it's not something that you can pretend doesn't exist. You can try, but his influence is there. And I'm a firm believer in shining an influence on, a, a light on his influence mm -hmm. and challenging him about some of the more contentious views he has. But also having the war debate with someone who was absolutely on the pro-Palestinian side, but challenging him about it all the way through in a very yeah, fiery calling him spineless. debate. Yeah, yeah. You, that being listened to by 15 million people, most of whom are impressionable young men, I think is a good thing. I think they're getting both sides of the argument in a way that if I didn't sit down with someone like Tate, only his view would go out mm. to those people. So people can have their own minds about the decision to platform him, but that's my response. Did you try to get him to take his sunglasses off, Piers? I did, but he's, you know, it's all an act, isn't it? So, um, yeah, as he said himself, it, you know, like, it's hard to know with him where the performative stuff begins and ends. Yeah. I think, you know, I, do I think he believes everything he says? No. Do I know where that line is? No. He's a very uh, aggressive, confident But yet you're still performer. interested to hear from him. Well, I know that millions that of people, people are. are. So the question then becomes, do they only get exposed to Andrew Tate's own videos? controlled by him with one view or his tweets to eight, nine million people, one view? Or do they listen to a debate with someone like me that will challenge him every step of the way about his arguments and they can make up their minds in a more nuanced way? I think that's a risk worth taking. We're living in a new age in terms of journalism, aren't we? And this, your programme leans into that and we've sort of talked about it already. We are, we are now, you know, seeking journalistic opinion... Mm seeking opinion on both sides from YouTube commentators, mm. albeit incredibly popular mm. YouTube commentators like Andrew Tate, like Jordan Peterson. Is that is that where we're going, do you think, that actually the biggest uh. voices out there are now not living in the mainstream media? No question. No question. But and, living and, online. And people like Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro and others, they do exist on mainstream as well. Mm. I mean, I would say they are mainstream, actually. Um, the difference with, with Tate is he's been removed from most mainstream platforms, but they haven't. Um, and I think that they are they, they have huge influence and, and reach. And a lot of my journalist friends don't seem to get this world at all. I'm lucky. I've got three sons, two in their 20s, 130, who absolutely live this world. And all their friends do. So I was able to catch this wave earlier than most of my crusty old journalist friends here because they were saying, Dad, no one our age watches TV. We all watch YouTube, right? So get with the YouTube program or no one's going to watch your stuff. Yeah. And they were absolutely right. Now, you can still have a linear presence as we have with Talk TV. And in fact, we've had record numbers for our show in the last few weeks on Talk TV as well, consistently, at night after night, beating Sky, beating GB News, beating the BBC uh, a number of times as well, which is very gratifying that we're getting that linear audience. But the YouTube audience is gigantic. Yeah. And I would add things like TikTok. You know, we've got a million and a half followers on our TikTok channel. Facebook is huge for us. I have nearly 9 million followers 
on Twitter myself. So when I promote my interviews to 9 million people on Twitter, you're getting collectively gigantic eyeballs for these things. That's why people like when Netanyahu came to London in March in the middle of the big social protests domestically in Israel, his team reached out to us asking, would we do the interview? And when I questioned this later, although I had interviewed him before, the explanation was, you have a massive global online reach. So we're seeing tangible results of mm. this now. Uh, the president of Israel joined me for an hour uh, several weeks ago, again, because they believe that we're getting such huge numbers on our show, it's more worthy of their time than getting 15 minutes on the BBC where you may get a fraction of that audience. What's with the interrupting? Um, I never interrupt. <laughs> I've actually been I've actually been much better in the last two months. If anything, what this conflict's shown me is the power of not interrupting, and people have commented on that. So I used to use interruption as a powerful tool. I think when people try to obfuscate, answer a different question, especially the government ministers in the COVID pandemic and so on, you know, they were desperate not to have to answer the question I was asking them. Then I think interrupting is perfectly valid. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, by the way. <laughs> but uh, but I think in the last two months, I've actually learned a, an unusual new trick to my armoury, which is the power of listening. And it's, who knew, it's quite effective. The Jeremy Corbyn interview mm. was very Yeah, because he wouldn't answer the question. He kept yeah. trying to deflect. Mm. And that's a perfect example of where the interruption is not only a good thing, it's a vital necessity of that interview. Otherwise, he was never going to answer the question. In the end, he refused to answer it so many times and was so obviously trying to deflect and, and deliberately not answer it, we all got our answer. Because if he believed another way, he'd have said it. So sometimes the interrupting can force a non-answer, which is actually an answer. Where do you go with this now? The war may continue mm. for months, for years. Will you continue offering equal platform? Will you have a dilemma in a month or so's time when perhaps the news agenda has moved sideways, not necessarily on, but we've seen this with the Russia war mm. uh, as well, that it's not top of the agenda anymore. So where do you go with your coverage? Well, we've look, we've gained 700,000 subscribers to our YouTube channel in two months. It's pretty extraordinary. We're getting 10,000 new people subscribing every single day just to our YouTube channel. And like I said, the linear numbers as well on Talk TV have been really strong. Uh, and I think that the sky's the limit for our show. I, I would argue with my normal humility that right now we're probably the biggest show of our kind in the world. The numbers speak for themselves. There is no news current show in the world that's doing the kind of mm. audience numbers but that we're do doing. how do you hang on to that long well, term? Well, look, the, the American election is going to heat up pretty soon. We've got the Iowa caucuses in the, the second week of January. We've got a British election coming next year too. There are lots of big things coming, which what we have now is a massively bigger platform than we did even two months ago. And we've seen just such extraordinary growth that I think that my only message to the team is keep with the big bookings, keep with the big debates, but don't be afraid to go off into other news stories when they blow up. Don't be afraid to go off into other debate areas. You know, we'll do one tonight about the Omid Scobie book on, uh, on uh, the royal family. We'll have a little segment about that as well as the extensive coverage of Israel and so on. I've got no problem doing other stuff. It's just at the moment, for the last two months, this has been pretty much yeah. the only news story for all news channels. And finally, do you think you'll remain impartial on this? Do you think you do you think you will arrive at a point where you do want to offer your opinion? I might. I might. I mean, there might be a point when my persistent defence of Israel's right to defend itself is altered by the if I believe that the response is just being totally disproportionate. And the fascinating question for me with this pause we're having right now is what happens next? If, as some reports are suggesting, Israel is going to start attacking the south and doing to the south what it did to the north, there's going to be no Gaza left. Where do these people go after this war? It can't be occupied by Israel. Otherwise, that really is a form of the kind of genocide that the Palestinians have been talking about. I don't think so far Israel's committed an act of genocide. If they wanted to do that, they'd have blown the whole place up. They've got the power to do it. But I do think that world opinion will be dictated by how they spend the next few weeks and months. And if they do start to steamroll in the south, I think you'll see a lot of anger fermenting amongst its own allies, including America. So it's going to be very interesting. And, you know, would I, at that stage, perhaps start 
saying the stuff I was saying in 2014, I could absolutely see myself saying things like that. So I, you know, look, let's take it as it is. At the moment, people conveniently on the pro-Palestinian fight do not want to talk about October the 7th. They don't want to talk about Hamas. They don't want to talk about them being a terror group. They don't want to talk about the traumatic effect this had on Israelis and on Jewish people because it's convenient for them to focus solely on the response. Uh, and I understand why Israel wants to get rid of Hamas and I agree with them that they need to do that. The question is, how do they do it? And I don't know the answer to that. So the answer to your question is, let's wait and see. Piers Morgan, thanks so much for speaking to Thank us. Thank you.